Speaking of Courage, page 131 through 148. The war was over, and there was no place in particular to go. Norman Bowker followed the tar road on its seven-mile loop around the lake. Then he started all over again, driving slowly, feeling safe inside his father's big Chevy, now and then looking out at the lake to watch the boats and water skiers and scenery. It was Sunday, and it was summer, and the town seemed pretty much the same. The lake lay flat and silvery against the sun. Along the road the houses were all low-slung and split-level and modern, with big porches and picture windows facing the water. The lawns were spacious. On the lake side of the road, where real estate was most valuable, the houses were handsome and set deep in, well kept and brightly painted, with docks jutting out into the lake, and boats moored and covered with canvases, and neat gardens and sometimes even gardeners, and stone patios with barbecue spits and grills, and wooden shingles saying who lived there. On the other side of the road, to his left, the houses were also handsome, though less expensive and on a smaller scale and with no docks or boats or gardeners. The road was a sort of boundary between the affluent and the almost affluent, and to live on the lake side of the road was one of the few natural privileges in a town of the prairie, the difference between watching the sun set over cornfields or over the water. It was a graceful, good-sized lake. Back in high school at night, he had driven around and around it with Sally Kramer, wondering if she'd want to pull into a shelter of Sunset Park or other times with his friends talking about urgent matters, worrying about the existence of God and theories of causation. Then there had not been a war, but there had always been the lake, which was the town's first cause of existence, a place for immigrant sh settlers to put down their load. <clears throat> before the settlers were the Sioux, and before the Sioux were the vast open prairies, and before the prairies there was only ice. The lake bed had been dug out by the southernmost advance of the Wisconsin glacier. Fed by neither streams nor springs, the lake was often filthy and algaed, relying on fickle prairie rains for replenishment. Still, it was the only important body of water within forty miles, a source of pride, nice to look at on bright summer days, and later that evening it would color up with fireworks. Now in the late afternoon it lay calm and smooth, a good audience for silence a seven-mile circumference that would be traveled by slow car in twenty-five minutes. It was, not it was not such a good lake for swimming. After high school he'd caught an ear infection that had almost kept him out of the war, and the lake had drowned his friend, Max Arnold, keeping him out of the war entirely. Max had been one who liked to talk about the existence of God. No, I'm not saying that, he'd argue, against the drone of the engine. I'm saying it's a possible as an idea even necessary as an idea, a final cause in the whole structure of causation. Now he knew, perhaps. Before the war they'd driven around the lake as friends, but now Max was just an idea. And most of Norman Bowker's other friends were living in Des Moines or Sioux City, or going to school somewhere, or holding down jobs. The high school girls were mostly gone or married. Sally Kramer, who's picked whose pictures he had once carried in his wallet, was one who had married. Her name was now Sally Gustafson, and she lived in a pleasant blue house on the less expensive side of Lake Road. On his third day home he'd seen her out mowing the lawn, still pretty, in a lacy red blouse and white shorts. For a moment he'd almost pulled over, just to talk, but instead he pushed down hard on the gas pedal. She looked happy. She had her house and her new husband, and there was really nothing he could say to her. The town seemed remote somehow. Sally was married, and Max had drowned, and his father was at home watching baseball on national TV. Norman Bowker shrugged. No problem, he murmured. Clockwise, as if in orbit, he drove the Chevy on another seven-mile turn around the lake. Even in the late afternoon, the day was hot. He turned on the air conditioner, then the radio, and he leaned back and let the cold air and music blow over him. Along the road, kicking stones in front of them, two boys were hiking with knapsacks and toy rifles in canteens. He honked going by, but neither boy looked up. He already, already he had passed them six times, forty-two miles, nearly three hours without stop. He watched the boys recede in his rearview mirror. They turned a soft brownish color, like the sand, before finally disappearing. He tapped down lightly on the accelerator. Out on the lake's 
Out on the lake a man's motorboat had stalled. The man was bent over the engine, with a wrench and a frown. Beyond the stalled boat there were other boats, and a few water skiers, and the smooth July waters, and an immense flatness everywhere. Two mud hens floated silently beside a, a white dock. The road curved west, where the sun had now dipped low. He figured it was close to five o'clock. Twenty after, he guessed. The sun had taught him to tell time without clocks, and even at night, waking from sleep, he could usually place it within ten minutes either way. What he should do, he thought, is stop at Sally's house and impress her with his new time-telling trick of his. They'd talk for a while, catching up on things, and then he'd say, Well, better hit the road. It's 5.34. And she'd glance at her wristwatch and say, Hey, how'd you do that? And he'd give a casual shrug and tell her, It was just one of those things you pick up. He'd keep it light. He wouldn't say anything about anything. How's it being married? he might ask. And he'd nod at whatever she answered with, and he would not say a word about how he'd almost won the Silver Star for Valor. He drove past Slater Park, and across the causeway and past Sunset Park. The radio announcer sounded tired. The temperature in Des Moines was eighty-one degrees, and the time was five-thirty-five. And all you on the road, drive extra careful now for this fine Fourth of July. If Sally had not been married, or if his father were not such a baseball fan, it would have been a good time to talk. The Silver Star, his father might have said. Yes, but I didn't get it. Almost. Not but not quite, and his father would have nodded, knowing full well that many brave men do not win medals for their bravery, and that others win medals for doing nothing. As a starting point, maybe, Norman Bowker might have then listed the seven medals he did win. The Combat Infantryman's Badge, the Air Medal, the Army Commendation Medal, the Good Conduct Medal, the Vietnam Campaign Medal, the Bronze Star, and the Purple Heart though his wound was minor and did not leave a scar, did not hurt, and never had. He would have explained to his father that none of those decorations was for uncommon valor. They were for common valor, the routine, daily stuff, just humping, just enduring. But that was worth something, wasn't it? Yes, it was, worth plenty. The ribbons looked good on the uniform in his closet, and if his father were to ask, he would have explained what each signified and how he was proud of all of them especially the combat infantryman's badge, because it meant he had been there as a real soldier, and had done all the things soldiers do, and therefore it wasn't such a big deal that he could not bring himself to be uncommonly brave. And then he would have talked about the medal he did not win, and why he did not win it. I almost won the Silver Star, he would have said. How's that? Just a story. So tell me, his father would have said. Slowly then, circling the lake, Norman Bowker would have started by describing the Song Trabong. A river, he would have said. The slow, flat, muddy river. He would have explained how during the dry season it was exactly like any other river, nothing special. But how in October the monsoons began and the whole situation changed. For a solid week the, dry, the rains never stopped, not once. And so after a few days the Song Trabong overflowed its banks and the land turned into a deep, thick mud for a quarter mile on either side. Just muck. No other word for it. Like quicksand, almost, except the, sink, the stink was incredible. You couldn't even sleep, he'd tell his father. At night you'd find a high spot and you'd doze off, but then later you'd wake up because you'd be buried in all that slime. You'd just sink in. You'd feel it ooze up over your body and sort of suck you down. And the whole time there was that constant rain. I mean, it never stopped, not ever. Sounds pretty wet, his father would have said, pausing briefly. So what happened? You really want to hear this? Hey, I'm your father. Norman Bowker smiled. He looked out across the lake and imagined the feel of his tongue against the truth. Well, this one time, this one night out by the river, I wasn't very brave. You have seven medals. Sure. Seven, count em. You weren't a coward either. Well, maybe not. But I had this chance, and I blew it. The stink. That's what got to me. I couldn't take the goddamn awful smell. If you don't want to say more, I do want to. All right, then. Slow and sweet. Take your time. The road descended into the outskirts of town, turning west past the junior college and the tennis courts, then past 
Chautauqua Park, where the picnic tables were spread with sheets of colored plastic, and where picnic ta picnickers sat in lawn chairs and listened to the high school band playing salsa marches under the band shell. The music faded after a few blocks. He drove beneath a canopy of elms, then along a stretch of open shore, then past the municipal docks where a woman and pedal pushers stood casting for bullheads. There were no other fish in the lake except for perch and a few worthless carp. It was a bad lake for swimming and fishing both. He drove slowly. No hurry. Nowhere to go. Inside the Chevy the air was cool and oily smelling, and he took pleasure in the steady sounds of the engine and air conditioning. A tour bus feeling, in a way, except the town was to he was touring seemed dead. Through the windows, as if a stop-motion photograph, the place looked as if it had been hit by nerve gas. Everything still and lifeless, even the people. The town could not talk and would not listen. "'How'd you like to hear about the war?' he might have asked. But the place could only blink and shrug. It had no memory, therefore no guilt. The taxes got paid, and the votes got counted, and the agencies of government did their work briskly and politely. It was a brisk, polite town. It did, it did not know shit about shit, and did not care to know. Norman Bowker leaned back and considered that he might have, what he might have said on the subject. He knew shit. It was his speciality, the smell in particular, but also the numerous varieties of texture and taste. Some day he'd give a lecture on the topic, put on a suit and tie, and stand up in front of the Kiwanis Club, and tell the guys about all the wonderful shit he knew. Pass out samples, maybe. Smiling at this, he clamped a steering wheel slightly right of center, which produced a smooth clockwise motion against the curve of the road. The Chevy seemed to know its own way. The sun was lower now, 5.55, he decided, 6 o'clock tops. Along an unused railway spur, four men labored in the shadowy red heat, setting up a platform and steel launchers for the evening fireworks. They were dressed alike in khaki trousers, work shorts, visored caps, and brown boots. Their faces were dark and smudgy. "'Want to hear about the silver star I almost won?' Norman Bowker whispered but none of the workmen looked up. Later they would blow color into the sky. The lake would sparkle with reds and blues and green like a mirror, and the picnickers would make low sounds of appreciation. Well, see, it never stopped raining, he would have said. The muck was everywhere. You couldn't get away from it. He would have a pause. He would have paused a second. Then he would have told about the night by the bivouac in a field along the Song Trabong, a big swampy field beside the river. There was a villa nearby, fifty meters downstream, and right away a dozen old mamasans ran out and started yelling. A crazy scene, he would have said. The mamasans just stood there in the rain, soaking wet, yapping away about how this field was bad news. Number ten, they said, evil ground, not a good spot for good G.I.s. Finally, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross had to get out his pistol and fire off a few rounds just to shoo them away. But then it was almost dark. So they set up a perimeter, ate chow, and then crawled under their ponchos and tried to settle in for the night. But the rain kept getting worse. And by midnight the field turned into soup. Just this deep, oozy soup, he would have said. Like sewage or something. Thick and mushy. You couldn't sleep. You couldn't even lie down, not for long, because you'd start to sink under the soup. Real clammy. You could feel the crud coming up inside your boots and pants. Here Norman Bowker would have squinted against the low sun. He would have kept his voice cool, no self-pity. But the worst part, he would have said quietly, was the smell. Partly it was the river, a dead fish smell, but it was something else, too. Somebody finally figured it out. What this was? It was a shit field. The village toilet. No indoor plumbing, right? So they used a field. I mean, we were camped in a damn shit field. He imagined Sally Kramer closing her eyes. If she were here with him in the car, she would have said, Stop it. I don't like that word. That's what it was. All right, but you don't have to use that word. Fine. What should we call it? She would have glared at him. I don't know. Just stop it. Clearly, he thought, this was not a story for Sally Kramer. She was Sally Gustafson now. 
No doubt Max would have liked it, the irony in particular, but Na Max had become a pure idea, which was its own irony. It was just too bad. If his father were here riding shotgun around the lake, the old man might have glanced over for a second, understanding perfectly well that it was not a question of offensive language, but a fact. His father would have sighed and folded his arms and waited. A shit field, Norman Bowker would have said. And later that night, I could have won the Silver Star for Valor. Right, his father would have murmured. I hear you. The Chevy rolled slowly across the viaduct and up the narrow tar road. To the right was open lake. To the left, across the road, most of the lawns were scorched dry like October corn. Helplessly round and round, a rotating sprinkler scattered lake water on Dr. Mason's vegetable garden. Already the prairie had been baked dry. But in August it would get worse. The lake would turn green with algae, and the golf course would burn up, and the dragonflies would crack open for want of good water. The big Chevy curved past Centennial Beach and the A&W root beer stand. It was his eighth revolution around the lake. He followed the road past the handsome houses with their docks and wooden shingles, back to Slater Park, across the causeway, around to Sunset Park, and as though riding on the tracks. The two little boys were still trudging along on their seven-mile hike. 